Good evening. I'm Patricia Van Skyke, Director of the Lloyd Library, and I'd like to welcome you to Emerging Cicadas at the Lloyd with Dr. Jean Kritzke. The Lloyd Library, as many of you know, was founded by the Lloyd brothers in the 1800s as they researched, developed, and manufactured nature-based drugs. We're well known for our collections on medicinal plants and our botanical works, but many people are unaware of the fact that we have an extensive collection of entomological works or books on insects, including cicadas. In fact, our books on cicadas go back hundreds of years. Dr. Jean Kritzke is undoubtedly the leading authority on cicadas. Among his many accomplishments, he's a Fulbright scholar. He's published many works on cicadas, including an article entitled, Take Two, Cic Take Two Cicadas and Call Me in the Morning, a reference to the use of cicadas in Chinese medicine. He also has a new book out on cicadas, which we'll hear more about tonight. He's the man before, behind the Cicada Safari smartphone app, and he's just about everybody's go-to guy when it comes to cicadas. This is his third cycle researching Brood 10, and he's been doing work at the Lloyd Library since the 1980s, when in 1987, he was on sabbatical and came here about one day a week to research cicadas. We're very excited to hear where his research has led him, and with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jean Kritzke. Thank you, Hi, Patricia. Jean. How are you doing? Thank you for that nice introduction. I hope everybody's doing well this evening. And uh, it's sort of strange not to be down at the Lloyd. Uh, the last uh, one of the recent times I was there was when uh, Dr. Nick Money did a presentation on, uh, on his book, Work on Mushrooms, and uh, enjoyed that series quite a bit. So... Uh, without further, I'm going to go right to my slides and start talking because they're better interesting than, to look, than looking at me. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and take us to the uh, slides. And there we go. Well, uh, we're here for another Brood 10 year. And my goal this evening is to introduce everybody to periodical cicadas, uh, what they are, what they aren't, and uh, take you through the whole process of their biological diversity, how we number them by broods, and uh, their, what you should expect between now and the end of uh, June, and then a little bit about uh, their impact on, uh, on American culture. So without further ado, let's start in. Uh, first of all, what are cicadas? Cicadas belong to the insect order Hemiptera. These are insects with piercing, sucking mouth parts. They include such things that you may see around your house every once in a while, such as the stink bug, we have, of course, had the brown marmorated stink bug uh, as a, as a uh, I would call it a nuisance pest in our area for a while. I hope you haven't seen the, the other relatives, the, the bed bugs. They are also relatives of cicadas, not as closely related to cicadas are things like aphids and leafhoppers and so on. There is a family of cicadidae, the family of true cicadas, and they're part of a super family that includes the, the family super family name is cicadaoidea, which includes things like hairy cicadas as well as true cicadas. Hairy cicadas look a little bit like cicadas because they're much more pubescent in their, uh, in their appearance. So now you know what the family is about. One of the questions I get asked all the time, and I'll get asked the next year, I, I can guarantee it, is didn't we just have cicadas last year? What are they doing back? Or I get asked a lot, we have cicadas every year. What's the big deal about this year? Well, that's because we have... 20 species of cicadas in, in Ohio alone. Uh, we have six species of periodical cicadas, and uh, we have 14 species and subspecies, there's actually 12 species, and two of them have a subspecies each uh, of annual cicadas. And it's really easy to tell them apart. Uh, the slide you see here shows four annual cicadas on the left and three periodical cicadas on the right. The two uh, periodical and annual cicadas are, are not to scale in those photographs. The, Annual cicadas are, are usually a little larger than the periodicals. But let's start with the annual cicadas. They will start emerging in early July, many times right after the periodical cicadas have died off. 
and they'll continue emerging into the uh, early fall. We'll hear them singing in the trees with their characteristic sound that bzz, 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 you hear in our trees late in the summer and through September and early October. Uh, they have a very different uh, uh, survival strategy. Notice they're green, brown, and black. That's camouflage colors. Their eyes are green or black. And if you look at their face, you'll see that the, between the eyes, it's almost a very flat line between the eyes, a little bit of a curvature, but not much. Um, if you hear these in the trees, you can walk up to the trees, you can look up into the trees. And you have difficulty seeing them because their backlit, of course, is one thing. But second, they're camouflaged. They blend into the tree quite, off, uh, quite thoroughly. Uh, they come out in very small numbers compared to the periodical cicadas, which adds more to their, their uh, difficulty to, in seeing. Uh, now, the periodical cicadas, on the other hand, they're easy to tell apart from the annual cicadas. They've got red eyes. They've got wings, membranous wings with orange veins, which is really quite, uh, quite spectacular, and uh, uh, orange legs. And some of them have some orange coloration on the underside of the abdomen. They will emerge in early May, and they'll be gone by the end of June. So periodical cicadas are here earlier and end before, usually before the annual cicadas come in. I have in some years found an overlap of five to 10 days, uh, especially if you're comparing cicadas, let's say down in Georgia and Florida with cicadas that we have up there. They'll come up a little earlier down there. Uh, and of course, unlike the uh, annual cicadas, periodical cicadas come out in enormous numbers to overwhelm their predators and uh, uh, basically have the, the feed all their predators, all the cicadas they want, and there's still millions left. It's amazing. Within the periodical cicadas, we've got three 17-year cicada species in Ohio, and we have three 13-year species in Ohio. There's one 13-year species that we don't have. But let's start with the 17-year uh, cicadas first. The 17-year cicadas uh, that we have in Ohio include all three of the 17-year forms. There's one large one and two small ones. And if you look at it from the top down, uh, other than size, they look very similar. The larger one is Magis cicada septendecim. It is about uh, one and three quarters inch from the uh, tip of the head to the tip of the wings. Uh, notice that as I point out the annual cicadas were straight line. There's this little ridge uh, that sort of points out in front of the periodical cicadas. It's not very noticeable unless you're looking for it. But when you look at the underside, then you can really tell them apart. The large species septendecim has broad yellow, I saw yellow orangish bands on the underside that makes it quite distinct. And it's larger than the other two. The other two cicadas are about the same size. This one in the middle here is Magis cicada cassini, and it has enti it's entirely black on the underside. The other small species is Magis cicada septendecula, very fine, fine orange bands uh, between the seg uh, on the on the abdominal segments. Now, right here, this middle one here, that's a female. Females have a pointed abdomen, males do not. And so that's another way you can sex these. Now, sometimes you might find a very small septendecim, and you might wonder, is it really septendecim or is it septendecula? There's another trick to separate those two species. This is septendecim, and here's the, and right between the eyes and the base of the wing, there's this orange patch. That will help you, allow you to separate those species. And so in addition to their calls being different, there's colorations that let us uh, separate these species. If you're going to participate in our mapping efforts with Cicada Safari, it's really ideal to photograph the underside of the abdomen. That'll help us identify what species that you're, you're looking at. With the 13-year uh, species, 13-year uh, Cicada species, there are four species, uh, two large and two small. The two large forms, as you see here, uh, have uh, they both have a very similar call, except one is at a different pitch from the other. And we have one that looks, th this one here looks very similar to what we saw over here with septendecim. And it turns out genetically, this thing is almost identical to septendecim, probably speciated in the last 15,000 years or so. Uh, this is called, go back here, this is called Magis cicada neotridecim. The may other one here, which is Tredesim, educated dress, the orange bands almost color, cover the entire abdominal, each abdominal segment. So that orange, intense orange is much uh, more uh, broadly based and, and uh, doesn't have the interspersing of black that you see in Neotredesim. Cassini looks just like the Cassini of the seven year form, and uh, Tredecula looks just like the underside of the 17 form of Decula as well. We do not have Neotredesim here in Ohio, but we do have these three species here. And 
having the 13 year cicada brood, my lab just discovered that back in 2001. That was the first time we recognized that we had a 13 year brood of cicadas in Southwest Ohio and 10 counties in uh, Northern Kentucky. So now you know the species. We also talk about brood 10. Uh, some people say brood X, it's actually brood 10. When we talk about broods, there's always, uh, in particular, we talk about a, a brood with a capital B and then the Roman numeral 10, which is, is an X. And so it's, it's natural that some people call them brood X. And I do admit, brood X does sound sexier. It sounds classier somewhat, but uh, this was not something that I created. This was actually set up back in the 1890s by Charles Marlett. He was an entomologist for the United States Department of Agriculture. And prior to this time, we had three different ways of counting cicadas, one by emergency year, one and two by broods, but the broods were mixed up in numbers. There was no real clear sense about how it would work well. So uh, in um, the, uh, the uh, uh, Marlet decided, let's create some kind of just system that'll work for everybody. And so he proposed that all the 17 year skaters that emerged in 1893, that's what we call brood one. If they emerge, 17 year skaters emerged in 1894, that's brood two and so on. And numbers one through 17 are reserved for 17 year cicadas. So when I say brood 10, you know immediately that we're looking at a 17 year cicada. If it's a 13 year cicada emerging in 1893, that belonged to brood 18. And numbers 18 through 30 were reserved, reserved for 13 year cicadas. And once that was put in place and looking at all the historic records and then looking forward to future mapping, all the broods sort of fell into place. And uh, it, it really helped bring some clarity to the uh, periodical cicada uh, concern. Periodical cicadas occur in the Eastern United States. Uh, you're looking at the, the blue dots represent where we find uh, 17 year cicadas. The 13 year skates are where the red dots are. Uh, they don't extend any further west than eastern Kansas, eastern Oklahoma, northeastern Texas, and just along the coast, along the Missouri River there uh, in eastern Nebraska. Uh, and it turns out when we look at these numbering systems, we try to work out what's going on with cicadas. There are 15 broods of periodical cicadas. There's 12 broods of 17 year cicadas. And there are three broods of 13 year cicadas. So for example, there's no, there are no brood, there's not a brood 11, there's not a brood 12, uh, there is not a brood uh, 18, uh, brood 18, uh, there's not a brood uh, uh, 15, or 16, or 17. So not every year is going to have cicadas, but when you, but of the, during some cycles of 17 years, we will find 15 with periodical cicadas emerging in some part of the country, but usually sometimes the 17 and 13 year forms overlap and that reduces that number. So here's what they look like. Once we start, I'm not gonna go through each one of these in detail, but this is brood one at the top. This is nine of the nine of the 12, 17 year cicadas, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And notice they cluster out. Let's talk about the ones that occur here in, in uh, Ohio and Northern Kentucky. Uh, our first brood is we'll talk about is, is brood five. And that occurs over the eastern half of, uh, of Ohio. And uh, uh, that uh, was last year, just five years ago. Um, the next brood that we have up in, in this area is uh, brood eight. And brood eight occurs only ex extreme northeast corner of uh, Ohio. Uh, this is brood nine, which we do not have in Ohio. And the remaining uh, three 17 year broods, here's brood 10. I'll show this map in large in a few minutes, but you'll see we've got a large population here in Southwest Ohio, uh, a few in Northern Kentucky as well, and Tennessee. Uh, brood 13, as I said, there's no 11 and 12. And here's brood 14. Notice that 14 and 10 overlap. And that's because 14 is slowly accelerating to come out at the, uh, at, at the same time as brood 10, which means that brood 14, which is a year class when they come out, the brood 14 years are going to get lighter and lighter. And it appears this takes about 300 years for a brood to totally shift to a new number. Here's our three 13 year cicada broods. This is brood 19, 22, and 23. 22 has a pocket of 13 year uh, cicadas that occur here in, Bra in Brown and uh, Claremont counties, and then about 10 counties in Northern Kentucky. And when these years, when these things come out, they come out for a orderly in a clockwork fashion, if you will. This is your uh, periodical cicada decoder ring. 
Uh, this has all the cicada numbers from the very first one that was known, that's 1634, when the cicadas were reported by the pilgrims in Plymouth Colony. It also shows here under brood 10, 1715, that's the very first time we, we uh, somebody in history wrote down information about brood 10. And uh, here we are at 2021. Uh, so you can uh, think about, you know, that's where we are. All these broods and the 18 other emerges that have occurred. Uh, the next one will be in 2038 and 2055. I'll be 84 in 2038. So I still plan to be working on that one. I'll be 101 in 2054. I'm not sure I'll care much about cicadas at that time, but uh, it gives the idea to look ahead. It's a goal to shoot for. Uh, here is the distribution of brood 10. And we make a big deal out of brood 10 because not only is it the largest of the 17 year cicada broods occurring over 14 states in the District of Columbia, it also is historically important because much of what we know about periodical cicadas comes from the study of brood 10. And that's because when brood 10 emerges, it emerges in cities like Philadelphia and Baltimore and Washington and Cincinnati. Those four cities were major cities in the late 19th century. And there were scientists living in those cities. And so we find research papers published during brood 10 years by people living in those in those localities. Uh, we uh, Philadelphia being the first was where Brood 10 was discovered in 1715. We've got a lot of papers from Brood 10 emergences such as 1734 and 1749 and 1766, all dealing with cicada events that occurred in and around Philadelphia. And so uh, that, that's part of the reason why they, they're, they're, Brood 10 is so important. We know a lot about it because that was the time when researchers living in these major metropolitan areas we're able to uh, talk about cicadas. So what should you be looking for? The first sign of cicadas for brood 10 this year has already been seen. And that's the form of these little chimneys. I assume many of you have seen these in your yard. They're little mud uh, extensions of the underground tunnel that the cicadas live in. You might remember it was about two weeks ago, we had a Saturday where we had rain almost all day long. And during times of, of prolonged rain, that'll cause cicadas their tunnels to get wet on the inside and to get to stay out of that uh, that water. Uh, what they, the nymphs do is they go up to the top and they ball up little bits of, of uh, mud and they extend their tunnel higher. This particular one is from uh, the Mount St. Joe campus in uh, 2004. And that's about uh, two and a half to three inches in height. The largest that that uh, been reported around 12, 10 to 12 inches in, in, in height. The largest I've ever seen is about six inches, but they, and you can find these by the hundreds. Uh, Cicada Safari in the last two weeks have had probably uh, two, 300 photographs sent in of these cicada chimneys. And I've seen them now at the Western Wildlife Corridor, Bender, Bender Mountain Trails. I've seen them uh, at, on the Mount St. Joe campus. The Caldwell Nature Preserve has them. Uh, a lot of people sent me photographs of the yard, so you may have seen these as well. Look for areas that are under overhangs that might are under tree branches that will that will lessen the direct impact of uh, of a lot of the rain uh, you might have a, a a pallet in the backyard that'll provide like a four inch space for them to build their chimneys in uh, that's what you should be looking for you want to find these so those signs have already been seen by the hundreds which tells us the cicadas are coming the cicadas are coming and so when will they emerge uh, I can tell you, we don't know. You know we, it, it, historically, they've been uh, the, before 1950, they emerged towards the end of May, 20th, 29th of May. But since 1950, especially over the last 34 years, uh, their emergence date has moved forward by about two weeks. And that's because the, one of the triggers that causes them to emerge is soil temperature. And they emerge from the soil when the soil temperature reaches 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Add to that a nice soaking rain, and boy, do they pop. And here's a photograph of a cicada nymph just 10 seconds out of the ground. It hasn't even pulled its body entirely out yet, and it's just emerging at that time. And uh, uh, this, as they say, this occurs uh, usually now in, in uh, mid to early May. Uh, we have a, a, a formula which tells it, which gives us an indication when they might emerge uh, given in any given emergence year. It uses Mar April temperatures as a guide. And based on those temperatures, it looks like right now we're expecting the cicadas to emerge around the 13th of May 
give or take two days on each side. So between the 11th and the 15th is when we're expecting the cicadas to emerge this year. Uh, that's a preliminary number because we uh, still based our, our model on the five day long range forecast. So as each day goes by, I can, I can fine tune that a little more. That prediction in the past has been 90% accurate. So it's not a guarantee, but that gives us something to look forward to. When they emerge from the ground, they come out by the hundreds and these holes about the size of your pinky. Uh, these uh, these uh, cicada uh, holes are from their tunnels underneath. And this particular picture is taken from one of the areas that I found the densest numbers of cicada holes ever. 356 cicadas per square yard emerged at this site. That's a lot of bugs. No matter how we look at it, it's a lot of bugs. And uh, the inset photograph that you see, uh, I wanted to see what the cicada tunnels looked like. So after the cicadas had emerged, I poured plaster of Paris down the holes and let it dry for two or three days, and then slowly excavated it like it was an archaeological dig. And that's what the tunnels look like. This one here is about six inches down on length, it just goes straight down. This one here in the middle is really elaborate with a little turnaround uh, bump on it. So the cicada could walk head first down the tunnel, hit here, back up into this, and then walk head first out. That's kind of cool. This is a little windy, uh, windy tunnel that uh, goes on. These are about eight inches deep, and this is about six inches deep. So as they emerge from the, these holes, and they emerge right after sundown, a day that, it's been, that the soil temperature has been at least 64 degrees Fahrenheit and that soaking rain, sometimes they're not all the same day. You might get 64 degree temperatures on, on one day and one or two days later it rains and then they come out in big numbers. And they want to find an upright, a vertical upright surface to crawl up. And what they want to do is start the transformation into their adult stage. And what they do is they climb up a tree trunk, uh, a pole. Uh, I've seen the dudes on tires blades of grass, brick walls, headstones, whatever. They climb up this vertical surface and lock, lock their tarsal claws, these little claws they have on each one of the legs to get a really solid purchase on that surface. And then if you watch carefully across the back, there'll be a crack in the brown skin of that nymph. And you see the creamy white cicada underneath. And that split extends to the head capsule and eventually frees up the head capsule, but doesn't go all the way down to the tip of the abdomen yet, because what's going to happen next is the adult cicada inside will start to wriggle its way free, pulling itself out of that nymphal skin. Isn't that just amazing? They continue to do that. And eventually they had end up hanging nearly upside down, held in place only, only by the, the, Ten, the tension of that, the opening of the uh, nymphal skin. These white filaments are the breathing tubes of the immature insect. As the adult comes out, those tubes have to be pulled out of the adult because the adult, they're also made of exoskeleton. So the adult can then breathe. So it sits there like this for about 20 minutes. These little, you might see the little brown at the at tips of the legs here. Those are the tarsal claws. They have to harden. It takes a few minutes for them, to, for the exoskeleton for these things to actually get strong enough that it can grab hold of its nymphal skin. So it does a, what I like to think of as a, a cicada sit up and it grabs hold of the skin and then it slowly wriggles its abdomen free. And once free, now you have a standalone adult periodical cicada, but it's not fully mature yet. What you see is this creamy white body with the red eyes. There's these three uh, simple eyes called the celli, these black patches behind the... Uh, behind the, uh, the head uh, and the wings are all shriveled up and the abdomen is some, somewhat uh, uh, compre uh, not distended as you see an adult. So the next thing you have to do is pump fluid through the veins to expand those wings. And uh, that expansion occurs over a few minutes and eventually those wings will be expanded to the point where they're held tent-like over the abdomen. And we have what appears to be a typical cicada, but notice it's not changed into the color uh, that you see of a typical cicada. It still has some more work to do. From, but from the point where it popped out of the ground and got to this point, about 90 minutes has transpired. So this is the kind of thing that if it happens in your backyard, you've got time to watch for a few minutes, go get a lawn chair or something to sit there and watch, uh, uh, get your favorite beverage and go out there and, and watch very carefully as this, thing, as this whole process happens. It takes about another hour and a half, depending again, depending on the air temperature for the 
cicada to turn color, it's called tanning, and to continue the hardening of the exoskeleton. And here you have your adult cicada with the red eyes, the black body, the orange wing veins you see here and orange legs. But it's still not ready to go out and start singing. You'll notice after you first see the, the large number of cicadas go out in massive numbers, you don't hear singing the next day. It take, they, these cicadas go up to the tops of the trees and they continue to develop their and harden their exoskeleton. And after about five days, they'll be ready to start singing and start the pre-mating process. The next morning, you go outside and the yard and trees and blades of grass are riddled with these ghostly reminders of what had happened the night before. Now, if you've missed it, if you've missed that first night, don't feel bad because that is going to happen again the next night. It will happen over a two-week period for all the cicadas in your yard to actually emerge and transform to adults. So you've got, you've got an opportunity here to, uh, to, to watch this several times. I must have taken 35,000 photographs of these things over the years, uh, shedding their skin and going through that transformation process. It's like having a David Attenborough movie in your backyard. It's just really cool. And they keep coming. They keep coming in bigger and bigger numbers. They keep coming. They keep coming. And literally, they are going to be here by the millions. That site that I showed you with the uh, 356 uh, cicada holes uh, per square yard, uh, looking at the area of that, it's from a cemetery, that area under the trees that were the, uh, the, 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 the canopy overhung, then uh, you could estimate based on the count of 356 that uh, that tree would give rise to about 7,000 cicadas. There were 26 trees like that in the cemetery and that little section of the cemetery produced around 230,000 cicadas. And that was just a small part of this, the cemetery. So if you're looking out, uh, where will I find these? They're not gonna be in open fields. They lay their eggs in trees and they have to mature by feeding on tree roots. So they're gonna be coming up under trees. If it's an open field, like a soccer field, no cicadas will be there, but you, you'll find them coming out from under trees. After about five days, the males will start singing. The singing process involves these structures called timbals. And you can see on this one here, the, the, I'm holding it back. I folded the forewing back. So this is the first abdominal segment. And here you see this sort of white uh, ribbed, it's lined with light, little lines on it, ribbed timbals. Inside the cicada, there is a muscle attached. And when that muscle contracts, it pulls in on the timbal and those ribs buckle and make a little sound. And you do that, let's say, you know, several hundred times a, a, a second, uh, you get a noise. And indeed, the male's abdomen is hollow to help resonate that noise better. And that's how the cicadas uh, make their songs, make their calls. Each of the three species has a different sound to their call. And uh, you can, all three species are going to be here this, uh, this year. And uh, you can very carefully uh, uh, hear them uh, in, in neighborhoods around us. Now, what happens is the male has a, a typical mating call, it sounds something like, uh, like a <whistles> that's from the Majesty Cicada Septon Decim. <whistles> when hundreds are doing it, it sounds like a, it sounds the whole background of the whole canopy will sound like uh, a high pitched sort of whiny sound that reminds me of the music they would put to flying saucers in a 1950 science fiction B movie. The, the uh, other species, Cass and I, which is the second most common in our area. Now you'll find that the, the uh, Magisticated Septum Nesta with the <whistles> call. That occurs in areas like with oak trees and mature areas, upland uh, areas. Castanet likes more of the floodplain areas, places that have been disturbed. Uh, and its calls are more of a series of buzzes and clicks, but the whole forest full of these things, it sounds like <whistles> It just sounds this, 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 this very intense rad, rad, rattling like sound. Third species, Septendecula, uh, which occurs in fewer numbers, probably five to 10% of them are probably Septendecula. They like the edges. And it sounds like a rotary sprinkler head. <laughs> now with the first uh, scale, let's use Septendecim as, a, as an example. The male, males gather in trees in large aggregations. Ecologically, that's called a lek, L-E-K. We call them in the cicada departments a chorusing center. And the males start singing. And when they sing together as a unit, the whole tree is screaming with these things. The highest I've ever measured this was at 96 decibels. 
and you know, Mount St. Joe is on the flight path to uh, CVG and uh, the jets flying overhead are about 80. And so when the cicadas are full force, they drowned out the jets flying overhead, but individually, and I'll show you the a video of this in a little bit uh, of how this happens. Uh, the males make a call. And at the end, right when the, uh, at the very tip, when the, the note goes down, that's when the female responds. She doesn't respond with a call because she doesn't have timbles. She responds with a wing flick. Right there. That's when the clap would be when she'd respond. Sometimes a second male, hearing the first male and also hearing that there's a female responding, will start to sing before that down note starts to confuse the female and stop her from responding to that male and respond to her. So there's a little audio competition, if you will, between the, uh, the, the males for that female's attention. If, the, uh, if there's not a competition for that, for that male, for, by the male from another male, uh, the female will continue flicking. The male goes into a second call, which is a... And then uh, when the, as the male begins the mating process, he'll be, have a third call uh, that's present. And uh, a mating can last several hours. Uh, this is a mating pair from uh, uh, Brood 14 in 2008. And uh, this particular one is, is a photograph I took of Madeira uh, back in 2008. Uh, it shows uh, some of these will mate tail to tail, but some of these will be in a V shape. Uh, it, it varies. After mating, uh, the female lays her eggs in the new growth of a tree branch. That's the terminal end where it's about the size of a pencil. And you can see on the slide here, this little dark shirt, that's the ovipositor that she's literally punctured that tip of that branch with. And this is a close up of the ovipositor. It's a long needle like structure. You might notice it's got some uh, notches here on the side. It turns out the, uh, the uh, ovipositor is serrated at the end. And so we have a, a central stabilizing rod. And on each side, there are blades that saw into the twig. Uh, some of the research I did with Matt Leonard at the uh, at Kent State University and Star Campus that was published just a year ago, uh, we looked at the chemical composition of the serrated edges, and it turns out they're impregnated with metals, zinc, manganese, and other metals, uh, and that helps strengthen them. And almost every insect that either lays its eggs in bark or it chews up bark, like the mandibles of, of certain uh, uh, wood-boring beetles, are also impregnated with metals. That ovipositor is inserted in the branch, and I'll draw, this is where the ovipositor would be, and as she pulls it out of the branch that she's now cut into, she then lays an egg on each side of where the ovipositor was inserted. And these are cicada eggs here, here's the other pair on the side there. And this is what the egg nests look like. Uh, they, uh, the female literally does tear up a little bit of the, uh, of the, uh, terminal branch with the egg laying process. Here you see a little bit of the, it's, it's split the wood and here's some of the, some of the wood fiber and some vascular tissue. She inserts her ovipositor here and then starts, as she removes it, she bring, pulls out the, uh, lays the eggs at the same time. When she's finished, she walks a quarter of an inch down, does it again and lays more eggs. Another quarter of an inch, inserts it again, lays the eggs and keeps going. She keeps going like this until she's until she's either laid all of her eggs or she runs out of a branch. If she runs out of a branch, she flies another one and keeps going until she exhausts her supply. And she has just over 500 eggs to lay. Now, sometimes this egg laying tears up the twig in such a way that it causes the, the leaves to darken and turn brown. And uh, we call that flagging. Uh, it is a, uh, uh, pro the, the leaves look like they're been, they've been hit by a, a hailstorm. Uh, not only do they wither and, and turn brown, sometimes they actually break and sort of dangle there like a, like a flag. And that's the call flagging. Uh, this uh, looks uh, ugly, but it turns out it's not entirely uh, uh, a negative. Uh, back in 1869, an American entomologist, of which there's a copy at the Lloyd Library, the, uh, it was, uh, there's an article published in 1869, which is a year after Brood 10's 1868 emerges, titled Out of Evil cometh good. And it was all about orchardists were saying they were totally surprised at the bumper crop they had in 1869, that uh, they were getting more apples and cherries than they expected to get. And it turned out uh, what the, this, this egg laying caused was like a natural pruning uh, resulting in a greater flower set 
the following year. And so that may be a benefit uh, long-term to, uh, uh, to the forest. And I'll, talk, I'll touch on that why in, in a few minutes. So uh, now the question that's going to easily be, you might be asking is, I, boy, I sure hope I have cicadas in my yard. There's a way you can find out. You can go and examine your trees. After one year, you can see this area, this egg nest right here is beginning to heal. The, the trees begin to heal over the scars. And when that happens, if that can, as that continues, here is a 17-year-old egg nest for this case that's totally healed up. And so if you know your tree morphology, you can go back and look at your trees, count back, find the annual uh, growth scar for the, for the branch. And when you get back to 17, you will see some of these healed up egg scars. If you do, you've got cicadas coming. Of course, you may have a yard full of moles and you've already gardened and dug up some nymphs, but this is another way to find out as well. Now, after the female uh, lays her eggs, she and the males die. And the car there are carcasses collected at the base of trees where given a nice uh, dewy morning in June or a nice light rain and some 90 degree temperatures, these things start to rot. And boy, do they stink when they rot. But that's also beneficial. Uh, the, the, the decay, the nutrients from the decaying cicada bodies provides a nutrient to cache for the tree. Indeed, a lot of people ask, what good are cicadas? Well, briefly, let's talk about it. Those holes in the ground that the nymphs come out of serves like a natural aeration for the soil. If any of you play golf, you may have noticed in times of the year, they will have aerated the, the, the golf courses, puncturing little holes in, in, the, uh, in the golf course. So that natural aeration also helps them during the times when we do get some summer rains to help water goes down those holes and, and, and nourish the or, or, uh, water of the trees. Second, when the adults come out in massive numbers, that's a food pulse, a food pulse that allows uh, uh, raccoons, squirrels, rodents, uh, uh, birds, uh, a variety of species to actually have a, 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 this opportunistic food supply, which can be useful in, in their producing more offspring. Now, you might not think it's a benefit to have more rodents being produced in a particular cicada year, but I'll tell you the owls and the, and the hawks are like it. And so that increased food supply in the, in the prey animals helps the, the predators as well. And so that's beneficial. I've already talked about how the natural prune, the natural pruning that results from the egg laying. And lastly, when the, uh, as, the, as these uh, uh, carcasses uh, decay, their nutrients from the decaying body go down in the ground around the tree that's gonna nourish the cicadas and their offspring for the next 17 years. And it's been well documented now with laboratory studies that they indeed uh, do create a nutrient cache at, uh, below the tree. Kind of cool, kind of fun. The cicadas are gone, the woods are quiet, but there are still hundreds of millions, billions of eggs up in the trees. Those eggs will hatch in six to 10 weeks after they were laid. So around middle of July into the early part of August, that's when the eggs hatch. You can actually go and, and take an egg nest in September and you can whittle it in and look and, and dissect out the, the, uh, the egg shells. Here's the egg, a, a hatched egg. It looks like a transparent uh, uh, elongated structure. Here's a, a cicada egg that did not hatch. The embryo did not develop. And you can actually count the numbers of these that survived to, uh, to, uh, to hatch. In most trees for a 17 year cicada, I was averaging 75% uh, of the trees were having a successful egg hatch. Um, in some 13 year cicadas, it got as high as 94%. As, uh, now, once the eggs hatch, in the trees, the first thing the, the newly hatched nymph does, and here it is, that's a one minute cicada, <laughs> old cicada nymph. As soon as they crawl out of the egg nest, they, they hatch from the egg, they worry their way out of the little hole up in the bark. And the first thing they do is drop to the soil. They don't walk down the tree, they drop because they are extremely vulnerable to spiders and ants and, ground, and carnivorous beetles. They drop to the ground. And as soon as they hit the ground, and I've watched this happen, it's really wild. They drop to the ground and they find it. They go down, they'll run down a blade of grass, which is only two, three inches in length. And they get under the soil at the crack of the dirt, right at the base of the, of the blade of grass. And they feed on grass, grass roots for the next few weeks. And then on New Year's Day, New Year's, January 1, 2022, the cicadas 
these first instar CAs will already mold to do a second instar, and they'll be 10 to 12 inches, 8 to 10, 8 to 12 inches below the surface feeding on tree root. And that's where they're going to be for the next 17 years. And they, they are rather cute when they're small. This is only about two to three millimeters. Here's a second instar, a third instar, a fourth instar, and here's a fifth instar just coming out to transform into the adult. One of the things that we know about this is they grow at different rates. So uh, from years one and two, you know, the, the blue are the second instars, the red is the third instars, yellow is the fourth, and the green is the fifth. Over the first 12 years of life, you'll notice that here we have both second and third instars. Here we've got second and uh, second, I'm sorry, the second and third. Here we've got third and fourth. And here we've actually got a, a couple third instars, a one fourth and some fifth instars already. They, they, we call this being a plastic growth rate. And as they grow during some parts of the, of the season, they'll actually move a little closer to the surface and back down, depending on how cold it gets. By age 13, all the 17 year skaters are in their fifth instar. They'll never molt again until they emerge as adults four years later. Pretty amazing. And you can walk out and look at all the trees around here. You can't say that that's really being hurt by cicada feeding because they don't feed that much. They're feeding on xylem tissue, which is the water conducting tissue with a couple of minerals and whatever else leaks out of the adjacent cells. That's all they're, they're getting from the plants uh, for their, uh, their development. They've got a symbiotic relationship with three bacteria that help them take what little they get from the, those, that nutritional material and use that to make a new cicada. So that's the, that's the life cycle of periodical cicadas. That's what we get to look forward to. And what we're seeing now is what just happening in a few weeks is the beginning of the emergence in a few days, probably in a week or two, uh, and then the transformation of the adult, and then the singing and the mating, the egg laying, the dying, the eggs hatching. Pretty cool. And that's what's been watched and noted for the last several years. Uh, the uh, uh, first time brood 10 was observed was here at the uh, uh, Gloria Day a Swedish Lutheran church. And that's in 1715, when uh, Reverend Andreas Sandel uh, wrote in his diary, the first report of any periodical cicadas belonging to brood 10. And what uh, Reverend Sandel wrote at the time is uh, rather poetic. He writes, May 9th, this is on May 9th, 20, 1715. And this month, some singular flies came out of the ground, the English, Call them locusts. When they left the ground, holes could be seen everywhere in the roads and especially in the woods. They were encased in shells out of which they crawled. It seemed most wonderful how being covered with the shell, they were able to burrow their way in the hard ground. When they began to fly, they made a peculiar noise and being found in great multitudes all over the country, their noise made the cowbells inaudible in the woods. They were also destructive, making slits in the bark of the trees where they deposited their worms, which withered the branches. Swine and poultry ate them. But what was more astonishing, when they first appeared, some people split them open and ate them, holding them to be the same kind as those said to have been eaten by John the Baptist. The first record of Brood 10. The church that you see here is the Gloria Day Swedish Lutheran Church. It still stands. And I'm hoping somebody in Philadelphia will take Cicada Safari and go and photograph this church because that is the Brood 10 mothership. If they're still there, it'd be rather kind of cool to note. Now, that's the oldest record of Cicada emergences. Uh, we had emergences in 1732, uh, which, involved, which uh, Ben Franklin was involved with. He uh, received information with one of his friends about how the emergence occurred. 1749, a pair calm who was a disciple of uh, Carl Linnaeus, came over from Sweden and collected periodical cicadas from Philadelphia and took them back to Sweden. And it was, it was Carl, uh, uh, Carl Linnaeus, which uh, uh, named the species Cicada septendecim. The genus name changed in the 1920s. An individual who's lost in the history of cicada work was Benjamin Banneker. He was a free Amer uh, Black American living in the uh, late uh, 18th century. Uh, he, his mother was a freed slave. He, his father was a, uh, from the Caribbean and never was a slave. And this individual was taught himself mathematics. He got the eye of uh, uh, Mr. Ellicott uh, from uh, uh, 
uh, Maryland and uh, or, or Virginia, I'm sorry, and uh, borrowed some books on mathematics. And he taught himself math to the point where he could actually calculate when eclipses were going to occur. He later in the uh, 1790s published a series of almanacs. He was also involved with the uh, survey work for the layout of the, of the, the new capital of the United States, uh, Washington, D.C. What I found about that, rather interesting was his, his experiences with Brood 10. He was a teenager in 1749 when they emerged, when he just tried to kill everyone he thought he could kill because everybody called them locusts and he thought they were like the plagues of locusts of, of Egypt. By 1766, he was now really into his mathematical studies and he witnessed the emergence of 1766, 83, and he wrote his in his notes just before they emerged in 1800. So he would have lived through four emergences of Brood 10. Now, the first three that he documented on, he was able to prove that they were clearly prime numbered life cycles. He was the, probably the, uh, the second person that could have done that. But he, again, his papers were not published. So a lot of people didn't know that he had independently uh, discovered as well. And he was quite intrigued by there being a prime number. What he did write in his notes is rather intriguing. He wrote, the hindmost parts rot off, and it does not appear to be of any pain to the cicadas, for they still continue singing until they die. What he was observing was a manifestation of a fungal disease that the cicadas get. And I'm, you'll see there's two on a table where the, the tips of the abdomen have already fallen off. I'm holding one in which the tip of the abdomen is still attached, but the whole body is filled with these canidia and these spores that affect the, uh, these uh, cicadas. Now, this was in the year 1800. This was written down. Uh, the, un the understanding of how the fungus worked and this phenomenon he described was not published uh, in uh, detail until 1851, 51 years later. He died just four years after he wrote this in his diary. Most of his papers were, were destroyed in the fire that uh, uh, occurred while he was uh, being interred and buried. Uh, but fortunately, his book with the cicada observations survived. And so uh, uh, we uh, have that to at least give Ben Benneker some uh, recognition. In uh, 1817, uh, overlapping at that time, it was uh, in uh, uh, it was in uh, 1783, and then seven, and then the year 1800 and 1817, that a man by the name of Nathan Nathaniel Potter, who you see here on the left, uh, got very interested in cicadas, and he wanted to study them from a scientific pr perspective. And in reality, he uh, he uh, ran out of time. He was a medical doctor, had too many patients. So in 1834, he uh, pay, teamed up with Gideon B. Smith. We don't have Smith's uh, uh, portrait, but we do have a, uh, a painting of uh, our autograph that you see here. Uh, they wrote up the first standalone book, a 39-page book on periodical cicadas. That And you see the color plate, that was these hand color plates that not only showed the the uh, the female and the male, but an egg, the 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 size and shape of the first instar, female laying eggs, the timbles, and so on. Now, Smith, after Potter died, was the one who kept track of when cicadas should be coming out, and he actually started crowdsourcing in the 1840s by sending newspaper articles out to papers all over the eastern U.S. Asking people, well, when you see cicadas, will you tell me about it? And, uh, uh, he, and by the time he was done and, and died in 1867, he had documented every all the broods of periodical cicadas, not necessarily their entire distribution, but he knew what how many broods there were. He died in 1867, and he was followed by a rather interesting individual. This is uh, Charles Valentine Riley, a gifted artist. That was one. Of, that's one of his paintings in the life cycle of. Uh, of uh, insects you see here. He was the first state entomologist in Missouri and eventually became the second national entomologist. And he wrote a major work in 1868. He also then wrote in his own work as the Missouri entomologist uh, in 1869. And uh, it turned out he got, was able to get hold of an unpublished manuscript by Smith, which he then excerpted and put and combined with his own notes in 1885 to get more information about the various roots going on. Um, he uh, passes away in the mid-90s by an uh, unfortunate bicycle accident as we gear up for the emergence of 1902. And by this time, there's been a lot of people gathering information about where are the cicadas. And this is the map that was published by the USDA prior to the 1902 emergence. And what they ended up doing is they sent out 15,000 letters, the USDA did, uh, to school, school superintendents, postmasters, railway station conductors, and uh, asking if you find cicadas, let us know. And so uh, uh, they received just done, uh, they, they were able to get about a just under a thousand responses. And from that created the much more thorough map 
of Brood 10. I've got uh, Teddy Roosevelt here because it turns out uh, Teddy Roosevelt, after his mother and his wife and then his mother died within 24 hours of each other, bought an interest in a cattle ranch out in North Dakota. Full disclosure, I'm originally from North Dakota and TR was one of my heroes as a kid. But while out there, he learned to herd cattle and project his voice over a herd of cattle. Here was this barrel chested man. He boxed in college when he was at Harvard and he could project his voice over a herd of cattle. Or when he spoke in Cincinnati, he could speak to a crowd of 10,000 and people thought he was talking to them. No amplification. The photograph at the bottom here is a speech he was giving on Memorial Day in Arlington National Cemetery where the cicadas were singing and the cicadas drowned him out. That's how loud the cicadas could get. The uh, work of mapping 1902 was the responsibility of this man, Charles Marlott, the guy that gave the cicadas their numbering system. And uh, this was the new map that came out after 1902. And uh, the, the, the USDA uh, continued the mapping into 1919. The, uh, after uh, 1919, the work of trying to uh, figure out where the cicadas are was left to this gentleman, uh, James Hislop. Uh, he is noted because he, he made the first movie of periodical cicadas uh, and it was called the, uh, the the periodical cicada and it was a black and white reel to reel uh, some of you uh, depending on if you remember these when you were in grade school I know I had them in grade school uh, that we'd get these free movies from the USDA and we all gathered in one classroom and we had a little projection we watched them I don't remember seeing the cicada movie as a kid but uh, it's a rather interesting uh, video now it's all not, not all science some of the things that happened during brood 10 years uh, don't relate to science, but relate to more cultural things, such as what happened in 1970 when Bob Dylan received an honorary degree from Princeton University. He's sitting there with the cicadas screaming in the distance next to Coretta, uh, Coretta Scott King, uh, uh, who also received an honorary doctorate that day. They were seen conversing quite a bit, and he seemed relatively bored and not necessarily very comfortable. You know, he didn't go and get his Nobel Prize, so he, that's not surprising. Uh, after the uh, award ceremony, he uh, uh, walked off the stage, took off his cap and gown and left and went back to California and he wrote a song titled The Day of the Locust. Let's uh, give a short uh, listen to just part of it here. So there you are, Bob Dylan, Nobel Prize winner, singing about cicadas. The next two years uh, for Brood 10 were the years that I was involved with its mapping. And uh, in particular, I was working with my undergraduate advisor, Frank Young, uh, to map out Indiana. And then I also mapped out uh, Ohio uh, in, 18, in 18, 1987. And then he, uh, unfortunately, Frank passed away. And so I mapped Indiana and uh, Ohio again in 2004. And what you can see here is the big circles are where the cicadas are widespread in the county. Small dark circles are, the cicadas are patchy in their distribution. Open circles are there, they're no longer in those counties, but they had been reported there in the past. As you can see here, the Northern half of Indiana, cicadas are in decline and we've lost them almost entirely in Northwest Ohio. It turns out in the 1890s and again in 1919, USDA thought the cicadas were in danger, terrible danger of, 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 of going extinct because of uh, deforestation for agriculture and uh, urbanization, uh, putting in roads, cutting up forests to bring in high intensity tra uh, power lines and so on. And we've been able to document that, that, that in parts of their distribution, uh, the periodical skaters of Brood 10 are in decline in certain parts of their range. I'll talk a little more just briefly about that before we finish. 2004, our last, uh, our last emergence that we had here, I was at Mount St. Joe and I was privileged to work with uh, Sir David Attenborough in the filming of his Life in the Undergrowth series. And I told you I'd talk a little bit about how cicadas sing. This look at, the, uh, at how the male attracts a female. After 17 years of living underground, the cicadas are now approaching the climax of their lives. And for the males, that means this. The call is his way of attracting a female. The 
females reply with a quite different sound. A click made by flicking her wing. So that's what the males are listening out for. I can imitate the female's wing flip with a flap of my fingers, and that causes them to follow me anywhere because they're so determined to find a female. Sir David Attenborough, frustrating cicadas at Mount St. Joe. <laughs> but that happened in 2004. It was great to work with him on that process. That's what you can look forward to. So what are we doing this year? What I'm asking your help for? I'd like you to help, help us map out Brood 10. And uh, we're gonna, we've developed a free phone app called Cicada Safari. Uh, it was developed by the Center for IT Engagement at Mount St. Joseph University. Uh, it doesn't track what you buy on Amazon. It doesn't track what you're we're searching for or, uh, on Google. But what it, what it does is after you download the app, it wants you to go out and look for cicadas. And when you see one on your Cicada Safari, you take its picture. And when you take the picture, after you take the picture, at the bottom is a little, you'll see a little paper airplane icon, touch that and sends the picture to us. And we have students and graduate students and colleagues of mine all trained to identify what is a real periodical cicada. And if your photograph is of a cicada, periodical cicada, it's accepted and it goes on a live map that you can use to monitor the, 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 how the emergence takes place over the year. In addition to the, uh, to the uh, video, uh, the photographs, we can also accept 10 second videos. And from the videos, we have the audio of the calls. And for those calls, we can tell what species are seen. So I, I hope that you will uh, download Cicada Safari available free from the uh, Apple uh, App Store or Google Play on for the Androids, and then uh, help us map out Brood 10 of the periodical cicadas. Uh, if you enjoyed tonight's uh, presentation, the new book, Periodical Cicadas, the Brood 10 edition is available on Amazon in three versions, a color version, a black and white version, and the E version, published by recently by the Ohio Biological Survey. So uh, I hope that you will help me map out Brood 10. I'm tickled to death to tell you that as of this afternoon, 54,000 people have downloaded the app. And we're looking at getting the best map ever of Brood 10. Thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? Hi, Jean. Uh, thank you so much for shedding so much light on Brood 10. Um, certainly answered my questions starting out about how the numbering system works. Um, and we, but we have a lot of questions that folks uh, that were generated as well. Good. So um, you spoke to cicadas um, contributing to the wildlife supply. But we had a couple of people asking, um, one, do uh, birds eat cicadas um, or avoid them? Well, turns out some birds love them. I've seen blue jays and robins grab these out of the air. They're clumsy flyers. They're not, they're not like a dragonfly that goes swooping through here. They're just going to be sort of tooling around. And I've seen these things grabbed out of the air by, by uh, the, the, those, uh, those birds. Uh, uh, Canada geese love them. And the Division of Wildlife has even reported that during turkey season in areas that have had a cicada year, the male turkeys have a larger than average body weight. So yes, birds do eat them. And we just got a question, is it harmful for dogs to eat cicadas? Well, you know, you know your own dog. If your dog is a, a, a gulper and a compulsive eater and doesn't know when to stop, then you shouldn't let them eat too many because they can cause uh, bowel obstruction. Uh, but if your dog goes out and nibbles on a dozen of them or so, that probably won't hurt them per se. But you know what your animal is like, how, like how sensitive the digestive system is. So you should watch them. But I've seen dogs, uh, you know, snap at them in the air and then get tired of eating them because that's their whole strategy of survival. Give their predators all to eat and they don't want any more eventually. 
So uh, we have a couple of questions about cicadas and what they eat. Um, you have mentioned uh, how in many cases they were actually good for trees, that they sort of acted as pruners, but um, we have questions about what about something like a young pine tree or a dogwood tree? Are there certain uh, species or ages of trees that are vulnerable and precautions should be taken? That's good. good question. Uh, they do not prefer conifers at all. Uh, they, they will lay their eggs in white pine because they have a longer internode space, but uh, they won't go after, they won't lay their eggs in, in uh, uh, firs, for example, or, or spruces very much at all because they just can't get their ovipositor down far enough. And if they do, the terpenes in the, in the, in the conifers kill the eggs to up to, up to 50% of the time. As far as the deciduous trees go, uh, and, and this includes uh, shrubs as well as trees, cicadas have been found to lay their eggs in over 200 species of woody plants. And so uh, they'll, uh, uh, they will go after anything. It's, if there's, a, if there are, there's an intense population out there, they will eventually lay their eggs in almost all the trees if they, if they, if they, can, if they can find them. If they can't find them, they'll fly up to a mile away to find them. Now, very young trees, uh, saplings that are, you might have, uh, that are like three or four feet, may only have one or two branches. Yes, those could be vulnerable. Although in many cases, the, uh, the, the stem is not big enough for them to want to, you, to do that with. Uh, if you have a tree that's between three and a half and five feet, and it's got a, just a small crown on it, you can uh, take a very flexible window screening and create a little bag to put around it, not hold it tight like a mummy, but just sort of let the whole canopy be there and safe and just stop the females from flying in. Uh, you can also use a, a, some kind of like a, bolts of cheesecloth, but again, you don't want to wrap them up like a giant Q-tip. Uh, that's not good for the tree and you want to allow, allow air and light to get to them. The easiest thing to do is not plant new trees until late June. That's the best thing to do easily with that. Uh, and then uh, uh, for, but for mature trees, uh, uh, yeah, the scales will look ugly for a while this year, but usually that doesn't cause us a, a significant damage uh, to most trees. We have more questions on um, cicada preferences. Um, somebody asked, are the nymphs picky about the types of tree root they feed from, like maple trees? And um, somewhat related to that, are cicadas selective in the tree species they lay their eggs? Uh, it doesn't, uh, the, the nymphs have no control because they're going to drop straight down from the branches where, where mom laid the eggs and they don't, they don't travel more than just a yard once they're in the ground. And so they'll stay probably usually under the tree in which the eggs were laid. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, cicadas have been found now in over 200 species of woody plants uh, and uh, they lay their eggs in, in uh, and we do find some preferences in, in the case that the receptin decim prefers, oak, likes oaks and mature upland trees. Uh, whereas we find, uh, I've noticed a really good population of, of uh, Cassini, the, the middle of the, uh, the, 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 the middle species I showed in my slide, the ones with the all black abdomen, uh, they seem to really enjoy some uh, Bradford pears. So on the subject of food, somebody asked for recipe suggestions. Well, uh, I no longer eat them like I used to because, well, they got me tenure <laughs> and that was very important in my career. But this year I've had more uh, interviews and comments about eating cicadas. I've got a chef in New York that's trying to find out where they're gonna go find them in New Jersey and things like that. Uh, there was a recipe published on the 6th of June in the Cincinnati Enquirer on page four. And uh, it's called uh, recipe for a periodical cicada pie. And it's take 50 newly emerged white female cicadas. That's important. You don't go get the dark ones. You have to get them while they're white, where they're just transforming and then get them on the ice box right away. Otherwise they'll continue the development. If you let them continue the development, they're, they're papery and hard like the tail of the shrimp that you hold that you dip the shrimp in the cocktail sauce with. So that's important. You want to get the females because the male is mostly a, a hollow chamber, whereas the female is filled with eggs. And so she's got more nutrition and more flavor. Uh, uh, this recipe recommends removing the, the wings, legs, and the head. Uh, it's not necessary to do that if you want to, although the head does have some uh, stuff that's maybe a little harder to digest. Uh, chop the cicadas into pieces and place in a bowl with stale bread that's been soaked in milk. Add sugar, rhubarb flavor, and cream to soften the ingredients. Place the mixture into a pie crust and cover with strips of pie crust placed in a crisscross pattern uh, similar to that of an apple pie. And here is the 
the lovely drawing of what that looks like. Mm -mm. <laughs> and uh, bake at an oven for 400 degrees until the crust is done. Uh, it said in the article that the, uh, that, that the, the people who enjoyed eating this pie claim it tasted like partridge and that, quote, quote, it was good eaten, unquote. Uh, I, I've had cicadas uh, blanched. I've had them battered and deep fat fried. I've had them sauteed. I've had them uh, in pies. Uh, I, I, I didn't particularly enjoy eating them per se, because but, but first I have a green flavor. Uh, to me, the, the, the flavor was pretty close to a, a really cheap can of cold canned asparagus. So we have a couple more questions, um, again, about food and the impact um, around where the, what's going on with the cicadas. So someone has asked, is there an impact on ground growing mushrooms from cicadas? Uh, we've not noticed that uh, in the past. Uh, a lot of times, as, as soon as those nymphs uh, get on the ground uh, as nymphs, they, they get under the soil pretty quickly. And a lot of the mushrooms grow in the, in the decaying leaf litter that's above ground, and they're going to be way below that. Now, I've not seen any study that suggests the carcasses that are left behind after, the, uh, after they all die, how that's impacted that. But uh, uh, I, I would doubt that would have a major impact, but uh, it could. And what about um, worsening mole damage? Is there any connection between what goes on with cicadas and moles? Well, that's an interesting topic. Uh, a study a few years back claimed, no, there was no relationship to that. I personally don't believe that. And I've actually asked uh, Tom, the mole man, <laughs> who you've seen, this. he's been doing this for 40 years now. And I just got an email from him a few days ago. He's got thousands, tens of thousands of records of treating people's homes for mole damage. And his calls increase, start to increase five years before any cicada emergence. And then, so they've started increasing about five years ago in 2016. Now they'll do drop off a little bit, but not much because what's going on, in, but they shift a little bit. We're going to find more of his business now going towards the east side of town because that's where brood 14 is. And so it shifts. And then after 14, his, the business and calls just drop off dramatically. Uh, so uh, that is, co is it coincidental or not? I think not because by the time they're about eight or nine years old, they've they've gone back up towards the surface about uh, four to eight inches below, right at mole level where the moles are digging. And uh, uh, so I think there's a relationship. Part of the problem why people thought there wasn't any is that and, uh, Tom uh, got for me some, uh, some moles from his traps and we dissected the stomach contents. And uh, it turns out cicadas underground are not hard and heavily sclerotized like the nymphs that come out of the ground or those shells that remain, they're very soft and, and tender. The only thing that's going to stay behind is this a dense little cleaning comb that's barely a millimeter and the tarsal claws. Otherwise, everything else is, is relatively soft and will just uh, not survive the stomach contents. So um, also related to holes in the ground, we had a question about the chimneys. Um, is the only purpose of those the channels and the chimneys uh, for the cicadas to emerge from, or is there another purpose? And the comment was that they seem to occur quite far in advance from when the cicadas actually emerge. Right. Uh, one of the things that you'll notice is that cicadas, uh, if let's say if, if magically the ground turned 64 degrees Fahrenheit tomorrow, we probably wouldn't have the cicadas coming out yet. Uh, for, and that has to do with the timing of how they mature to get ready for molting. Uh, last fall, by November, uh, the periodical cicadas that I dug up back then had already gotten red eyes. But that characteristic black patch that I showed you on the developing female, those are visible on cicadas when they come out of the ground to transform into the adult. And those develop shortly before they emerge. But until those develop, the cicadas aren't ready to emerge. And today I received probably 150 phot photographs on cicada safari of people working in their yards digging up nymphs, and none of those nymphs had any black patches. Now, that doesn't mean they don't have it. It turns out there are some instances where cicadas have already emerged. We've had a couple emerge in, in Maryland. We've had uh, uh, one emerge in, uh, uh, as I said, we've one emerge in Frankfort, Kentucky yesterday. We had a few emerge in, uh, in uh, College Park, Maryland, and we had about half a dozen or so emerge east of Chattanooga uh, yesterday as well. And uh, the one that emerged first, that emerged last week on the 23rd, uh, that was uh, a cicada. Uh, the homeowner 
decided to make a pot a plant and he used garden soil uh, from his house. And it got rid of, that was the night that it got down to 32 uh, here. So he brought the plant, in, the plant inside. When he woke up the next morning, there was a cicada crawling around on his kitchen floor. So he went out and he put it on, the, on a plant and it shed its skin and turned into the adult. That's artificially induced. That didn't happen on its own. Uh, but uh, back in 2017 uh, and in 2004, about a week before the main emergence, we had, uh, I'd say probably, say probably 50 to 100 cicadas pop up here and there around the city. There are some that are just going to be a little bit further ahead. And it could be related in part just to the micro environment, microclimate they're living in. It could be a, foul, a south facing uh, base of a tree. So it's in full sunlight, they'd be a little warmer and could have uh, matured to form metamorphosis a little sooner than the others. Uh, so uh, it's not like we'll see none and then they're going to see them all. There'll be a slow a few coming out over the course of the next, I'd say, 10 days or so. We're still expecting them to come out sometime in uh, probably uh, around uh, May the 11th through the 15th, some of there. And that is going to be, uh, if uh, it was May 16th back in uh, 2017 that the accelerants from, uh, came out in that year. And so if uh, the, the models are saying now maybe the 13th, and if that's correct, that's three days earlier. They were just four years ago. But again, it depends also on rain as well. So we have some questions about the distribution of cicadas. One question is, why so concentrated? And why do we see them in Indiana and not Illinois? And then another question about the distribution. We think about climate change as things warm up. Does that mean that we would expect the cicadas to shift northward. Well, the interesting thing about uh, let's go to the first question: Why are why are they why is brood ten not found in Illinois? It does occur, and it probably is still in Illinois, but it only occurs in the two counties along the eastern margin of the state with Indiana, south of uh, of Danville. Uh, the distribution of cicadas that we're seeing that I showed you on the, on that of the uh, 12, uh, 12 broods of seventy year cicadas. A lot of that is related in part to what happened in the last 20,000 years. Uh, 25,000 years, the glacier uh, of the last ice age was just north of Tri-County Mall. There are no cicadas here at that time because there's no forest. As, the, as, it warmed, as, as conditions warmed up and the glaciers retreated by 14,000 years, they were just north of Toledo. And as they moved north, the forest came in behind them and did, so did the cicadas. And so a lot of the distribution, why are they, why do we find uh, brood 10 in such numbers in Indiana and Ohio? And yet we go out east, we find uh, brood 10 a little bit further north. The ice sheet didn't get as far south easter than it did here. Uh, so, that, and, uh, and, and if you look at the uh, geologic history of, uh, of uh, Ohio, we see brood 5 is in the eastern half, brood 10 is in the western half. They had different geological histories the last 20 years. And so that, that's, that's part of that that relates to that. Uh, as far as uh, climate change, uh, we know that the cicadas uh, come up with the soil temperature is 64 degrees. And in the last uh, uh, 34 years, the first day of emergence has is now two weeks earlier than it was the beginning of the last century. And that's not surprising. You go to a garden center now, you see these, these planting zones, and those planting zones have shifted north over the last 20 years as well. Uh, the one thing that uh, uh, is interesting is the impact of the warmer temperatures on the life cycle. It, tur uh, it turns out periodical cicadas count the years by monitoring fluid flow in the roots. Now the fluid flow right now, in the, uh, the winter just ended, so we're in the, in the spring. Uh, during the winter months, there's hardly any fluid flow moving through those roots. Uh, there was still a water column, but there, was not the, but there wasn't, the, the, the trees weren't making leaves and buds, what have you, and water wasn't being used. So there's no fluid flow for them to detect. Um, in uh, December of 1906 to January, 1907, uh, you may remember these, uh, that was an incredible December, January. We got to 65 degrees over the course of those two months. It got really warm here in Cincinnati to the point that the maple in my backyard actually budded and leaves started to develop. And then uh, come in February, we had a hard freeze and all that new growth drops. Six, seven weeks later, true spring shows up and the tree buds again, the whole process occurs. In 2007, that happened. Thousands of cicadas in Eastern Cincinnati where that happened came out a year early because they had two fluid flows that one year and thought 17 years passed. 
So that's gonna, it can interrupt that cycle. Now, if that process like I just described should occur in the first five years of life in a periodical cicada, uh, it causes them to come out four years early. And uh, we, we, uh, why, why that happens, we don't know, but uh, well, we know why the temperature gets warmer, but why that would trigger a four year development, we're not entirely certain. It looks like there's a genetic switch that triggers four years of growth. And uh, uh, we know that the difference between 13 year cicadas and 17 year cicadas is that there's one extra molt in the first five years of life. And so in 1991, when I was, while digging up brood 10, I discovered that there was, they were older than they should have been. That's what made me to suspect that we may have an early emergence in the year 2000, which did happen. And so uh, uh, that, that if, if they detect an extra year of past in those first five years, that could trigger an extra molt and shift to four and, and put them into a four year acceleration. That answers one of the questions that somebody asked, how do the cicadas count the 17 years? So that's how they count. What we don't know is how they remember what it was. <laughs> <laughs> that's the mystery. That's the mystery. I'm working on some experiments now with colleagues around the world on how to figure that out, but uh, I can't go into more detail than that. But we're, it's like, okay, we, we, it looks like there's a, a switch and that switch is, is tied into the genetics of their growth. So it's N times four plus one. If that switch is hit twice, that's two times four is eight plus one is nine. And we did have in, uh, just last year, we saw some 13 year skaters come out for nine years. If it's flipped three times, three times four is 12 plus one is 13. That's our 13 year life cycle. Four times give us 17 years, five times give us 21 years. And we've seen that kind of development in, in periodical cicadas, both nine, 13, 17, and 21. So I'm going to ask one more question from um, somebody in the audience before we get to the question, a question that a lot of people are asking about avoiding them. Uh, but since sometimes the 13 and 17 year cycles will line up on the same year, and somebody did the math and said every 221 years, uh, is it a possibility that they would interbreed? Uh, we've, uh, there is a slight possibility. It happened in 1998. So we had a chance to actually look and look for that. And it turned out the 13 year skaters came out about uh, uh, one to two weeks earlier than, than the 17 year skaters. So yes, it's possible they could interbreed if they overlapped completely in their zones. Um, but uh, that the overlap is not uh, always there. So you have to have them the geographically in the same place and have uh, let's say a, a spring that would delay the 13 year cicadas and, a, and then a warm spell that accelerates the 17 year, that's completely possible. And, and part of the reason why that may be the case is that we have uh, uh, in Neo, Neo Tridesum is genetically a 17 year cicada with a 13 year life cycle. And some have thought that may have been what happened with a acceleration event that might've been triggered by a, a, a fertilization. I'm not sure I believe that or not anymore. I did publish paper back in 83 about that hypothesis, but uh, and I thought it, it didn't work because we had all these accelerants here without any 13 year skaters. And then lo and behold, I discovered 13 year brood here. So that's, that makes life, that's what makes life interesting. Uh, those kinds of things. It's gonna happen again and with a real good overlap in 2024. That's when brood 19 and brood 13 are going to emerge at the same time. And they will overlap in central Illinois. And so there's going to be a lot of activity in central Illinois to see what's going to happen. Will they uh, interbreed or not? So, and finally, people want to know how can we detract them? Um, and also how far away do we have to go to get away from them? <laughs> well, I can tell you, I've had, uh, I've talked to 83 couples now about what, what to do about their weddings. And that's not just this year. That's uh, all my, from my 45 years of studying cicadas. Uh, first of all, uh, you want to repel them, I take it. Uh, there's not much you can do. They're clumsy flyers. Uh, they're not trying to fly into you. Uh, uh, if you, uh, uh, there are some uh, Briggs and Stratton motors for uh, lawn mowers and weed whackers that vibrate at the same frequency as Magic Cicada Cassini. And if you're doing yard work, they males might think that's a female coursing center and try to swarm you or not necessarily so they don't swarm like bees but try to literally land on you and what have you but uh, so that's the one thing don't do the lawn <laughs> that'll help uh, to stop that uh, you can uh, uh, you can wear bee suits and things like that but uh, they're not trying to land on you they don't bite or sting and they're just they're just big bugs uh, you can uh, uh, go out only in the evening. They're, they're not active at night. They're not flying around much at night. They don't sing mostly at night at all. Uh, so uh, uh, 
Um, that's your quiet time if you need some escape and you can't afford to leave or you're worried about leaving during the, 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 these days of, uh, of uh, towards the end of the pandemic. Uh, uh, if you have to go somewhere to get to avoid them, uh, it'll be hot, but Florida doesn't have them. Uh, they don't have periodical cicadas, but they got annual cicadas. It'll be out uh, by the end of, towards the end of June or go north into Canada. Uh, Canada, they don't go north from, they're not, uh, they don't occur further north than the, the lower oh, four or five counties in Michigan. So you can go up to upper Michigan, Miss Central and upper Michigan would be good. Uh, same is true with Wisconsin, if you want, or go up to New England, go to Boston and get some lobsters. Those all sound like great ideas. Well, Gene, I want to thank you for coming tonight. This was just absolutely fascinating. Um, and I also want to thank the audience, especially for your great questions. Um, we have an exhibition, virtual cicada exhibition that's on our website. So if you were intrigued by some of those early historic references to cicadas, you could see mo more of them. Um, on our website. And then June 11th, we are opening an exhibit in person here at the Lloyd called Incredible Insects, where there will be a cicada component, but there will also be beetles and bees and spiders. And uh, so if insects are your thing, definitely keep us on your radar. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you.